The Chernobyl disaster was a catastrophic nuclear accident that occurred on 26 April 1986 at the No. 4 nuclear reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, near the city of Pripyat in the north of the Ukrainian SSR. The accident occurred during a safety test on a common Soviet reactor type, the RBMK nuclear power reactor. The test, a simulation of an electrical power outage, was to aid the development of a safety procedure for keeping reactor cooling water circulating until the emergency generators could provide power. This gap was about one minute and had been identified as a potential safety problem which could cause reactor core overheating. Three such tests had been conducted since 1982 but had failed to provide a solution. On the fourth occasion, which became catastrophic, the test had been delayed by 10 hours, and the reactor operating shift that had specifically prepared for the test procedure was replaced by the next shift. The test supervisor then failed to follow the test procedure, creating unstable operating conditions which, combined with inherent RBMK reactor design flaws and the intentional disabling of several emergency safety systems, resulted in an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction. A huge amount of energy was suddenly released, which vaporized superheated cooling water, rupturing the reactor pressure vessel in a highly destructive steam explosion, which was instantly followed by an open-air reactor core fire. This fire produced considerable updrafts for about nine days before being finally contained on 4 May 1986. The lofted plumes of fission products released into the atmosphere by the fire precipitated onto parts of the USSR and Western Europe. The estimated radioactive inventory that was released during this very hot fire phase approximately equaled in magnitude the airborne fission products released in the initial destructive explosion. The total number of casualties remains disputed. Estimates of reduced life expectancy as a result of radiation release are highly uncertain and vary from 4,000 people in a United Nations study up to 200,000 reported by a Greenpeace study. During the accident, steam blast effects caused two deaths within the facility, one immediately after the explosion and the other compounded by a lethal dose of ionizing radiation. Over the coming days and weeks, 134 servicemen were hospitalized with acute radiation syndrome ARS, of whom 28 firemen and employees died within months. Additionally, approximately 14 radiation-induced cancer deaths among this group of 134 hospitalized survivors were to follow within the next 10 years. Among the wider population, an excess of 15 childhood thyroid cancer deaths were documented as of 2011. Additional time and research is required to definitively determine the elevated relative risk of cancer among the surviving employees, those that were initially hospitalized with ARS, and the population at large. The Chernobyl accident is considered the most disastrous nuclear power plant accident in history, both in terms of cost and casualties. It is one of only two nuclear energy accidents classified as a level 7 major accident. The maximum classification on the International Nuclear Event Scale, the other was the 2011 Fukushima disaster in Japan. The struggle to safeguard against scenarios that were perceived as having the potential for greater catastrophe, together with later decontamination efforts of the surroundings, ultimately involved over 500,000 liquidators and cost an estimated 18 billion rubles, roughly $30 billion USD in 1986, or $68 billion USD in 2019 adjusted for inflation. 
Kevin, the remains of the No. 4 reactor building were soon enclosed in the sarcophagus, a large shelter designed to reduce the spread of radioactive contamination from the wreckage and to protect the site from further weathering. This was rapidly built and was finished by December 1986, when the reactor was entering the cold shutdown phase. The shelter also provided radiological protection for the crews of the other undamaged reactors at the power station, with number 3 continuing to produce electricity until 2000. Due to the continued deterioration of the sarcophagus, both it and the number 4 reactor were further enclosed in 2017 by the Chernobyl New Safe Confinement, a larger, state-of-the-art enclosure, designed and built by an international team. This structure has the ability to facilitate the removal of both the sarcophagus and the reactor debris, while containing the radioactive contamination. The accident prompted safety upgrades on all remaining Soviet-designed RBMK reactors, of which 10 continue to power electric grids as of 2019. Topic. Overview The disaster began during a systems test on 26 April 1986, in reactor No. 4 of the VI Lenin nuclear power plant, near Pripyat and in proximity to the administrative border with Belarus and the Dnieper River. There was a sudden and unexpected power surge. When operators attempted an emergency shutdown, a much larger spike in power output occurred. This second spike led to a reactor vessel rupture and a series of steam explosions. These events exposed the graphite moderator of the reactor to air, causing it to ignite. For the next week, the resulting fire sent long plumes of highly radioactive dust into the atmosphere which caused radioactive fallout over an extensive geographical area, including Pripyat. The plumes drifted over large parts of the Western Soviet Union and Europe. According to official post-Soviet data, about 60% of the fallout landed in Belarus. 36 hours after the accident, Soviet officials established a 10-kilometer exclusion zone, which resulted in the rapid evacuation of 49,000 people, primarily from Pripyat, the nearest large population center. During the accident the wind changed direction. The fact that the different plumes from the reactor had different ratios of radioisotopes in them indicates that the relative release rates of different different elements from the accident site was changing, as plumes and subsequent fallout continued to be generated, the evacuation zone was increased from 10 to 30 kilometers about one week after the accident. A further 68,000 persons were evacuated, including from the town of Chernobyl itself. The surveying and detection of isolated fallout hotspots outside this zone over the following year eventually resulted in 135,000 long-term evacuees in total agreeing to be moved. The years between 1986 and 2000 saw the near tripling in the total number of permanently resettled persons from the most severely contaminated areas to approximately 350,000. The accident raised the already heightened concerns about fission reactors worldwide, and while most concern was focused on those of the same unusual design, hundreds of disparate nuclear reactor proposals, including those under construction at Chernobyl, reactors numbers 5 and 6, were eventually cancelled. With ballooning costs as a result of new nuclear reactor safety system standards and the legal and political costs in dealing with the increasingly hostile, anxious public opinion, 
there was a precipitous drop in the rate of new startups after 1986. The accident also raised concerns about the Cavalier safety culture in the Soviet nuclear power industry, slowing industry growth and forcing the Soviet government to become less secretive about its procedures. The government cover-up of the Chernobyl disaster was a catalyst for Glasnost, which paved the way for reforms leading to the Soviet collapse. Numerous structural and construction quality issues as well as deviations from the original design of the plant were known to KGB at least since 1973 and passed to the Central Committee which did not take any actions and classified it. Topic. Accident On 26 April 1986, at 1 hour 23 minutes and 40 seconds Moscow summer time, UTC plus 4 o'clock, reactor number 4 suffered a catastrophic power increase, leading to explosions in its core. As the reactor had not been encased by any kind of hard containment vessel, this dispersed large quantities of radioactive isotopes into the atmosphere and caused an open-air fire that increased the emission of radioactive particles carried by the smoke. The accident occurred during an experiment scheduled to test the viability of a potential safety emergency core cooling system, which required a normal reactor shutdown procedure. Topic: <laughs> Steam turbine tests. In steady state operation, a significant fraction over 6% of the power from a nuclear reactor is derived not from fission but from the decay heat of its accumulated fission products. This heating continues for some time after the chain reaction has been stopped e.g. following an emergency scram and active cooling may be required to prevent core meltdown. RBMK reactors like those at Chernobyl use water as a coolant. Reactor 4 at Chernobyl consisted of about 1,600 individual fuel channels, each of which required coolant flow of 28 metric tons 28,000 liters or 7,400 U.S. gallons per hour, since cooling pumps still require electricity and must run for some time after an emergency shutdown or scram, in the event of a power grid failure, each of Chernobyl's reactors had three backup diesel generators. The backup generators could start up in 15 seconds, but took 60 to 75 seconds to attain full speed and generate the 5.5 MW output required to run one main pump. To maintain cooling during this one-minute power gap, considered an unacceptable safety risk. It had been theorized that rotational energy from the steam turbine, as it wound down under residual steam pressure, could be used to generate the required electrical power. Analysis indicated that this residual momentum and steam pressure might be sufficient to run the coolant pumps for 45 seconds, bridging the gap between an external power failure and the full availability of the emergency generators. This capability still needed to be confirmed experimentally, and previous tests had ended unsuccessfully. An initial test carried out in 1982 indicated that the excitation voltage of the turbine generator was insufficient, it did not maintain the desired magnetic field after the turbine trip. The system was modified, and the test was repeated in 1984 but again proved unsuccessful. In 1985, a test was conducted a third time but also yielded negative results. 
The test procedure was to be run again in 1986, and scheduled to take place during a maintenance shutdown of Reactor 4. The test focused on the switching sequences of the electrical supplies for the reactor. The test procedure was expected to begin with an automatic emergency shutdown. No detrimental effect on the safety of the reactor was anticipated, so the test program was not formally coordinated with either the chief designer of the reactor or the scientific manager. Instead, it was approved only by the director of the plant, and even this approval was not consistent with established procedures. According to the test parameters, the thermal output of the reactor should have been no lower than 700 MW at the start of the experiment. If test conditions had been maintained as prescribed, the procedure would almost certainly have been carried out safely. The eventual disaster resulted from attempts to boost the reactor output once the experiment had been started and an operational misstep had let the output fall too low. Inconsistent with approved procedure, the Chernobyl power plant had been in operation for two years without the capability to ride through the first 60 to 75 seconds of a total loss of electric power, and thus lacked an important safety feature. The station managers presumably wished to correct this at the first opportunity, which may explain why they continued the test even when serious problems arose, and why the requisite approval for the test had not been sought from the Soviet nuclear oversight regulator even though there was a representative at the complex of four reactors. The experimental procedure was intended to run as follows. The reactor was to be running at a low power level, between 700 MW and 800 MW. The steam turbine generator was to be run up to full speed. When these conditions were achieved, the steam supply for the turbine generator was to be closed off. Turbine generator performance was to be recorded to determine whether it could provide the bridging power for coolant pumps until the emergency diesel generators were sequenced to start and provide power to the cooling pumps automatically. After the emergency generators reached normal operating speed and voltage, the turbine generator would be allowed to continue to freewheel down. Topic. Conditions The conditions to run the test were established before the day shift of 25 April 1986. The day shift workers had been instructed in advance and were familiar with the established procedures. A special team of electrical engineers was present to test the new voltage regulating system. As planned, a gradual reduction in the output of the power unit began at 1.06 a.m. on 25 April, and the power level had reached 50% of its nominal 3,200 MW thermal level by the beginning of the day shift. At this point, another regional power station unexpectedly went offline, and the Kiev electrical grid controller requested that the further reduction of Chernobyl's output be postponed, as power was needed to satisfy the peak evening demand. The Chernobyl plant director agreed, and postponed the test. Despite this delay, Preparations for the test not affecting the reactor's power were carried out, including the disabling of the Emergency Core Cooling System or ECCS, a passive, active system of core cooling intended to provide water to the core in a loss of coolant accident. Given the other events that unfolded, the system would have been of limited use, but its disabling as a routine Step of the test is indicative of the lack of attention to safety in the test. In addition, had the reactor been shut down for the day as planned, it is possible that more preparation would have been taken in advance of the test. 
At 2304, the Kiev grid controller allowed the reactor shutdown to resume. This delay had some serious consequences, the day shift had long since departed, the evening shift was also preparing to leave, and the night shift would not take over until midnight, well into the job. According to plan, the test should have been finished during the day shift, and the night shift would only have had to maintain decay heat cooling systems in an otherwise shut down plant. The night shift had very limited time to prepare for and carry out the experiment. A further rapid decrease in the power level from 50% was executed during the shift change over. Anatoly Dyatlov, deputy chief engineer of the entire Chernobyl nuclear power plant, was present to supervise and direct the experiment, as he outranked all other supervisory personnel present, his orders and instructions overrode any objections of other senior personnel present during the test and its preparation. In 1987, Dyatlov would be found guilty of criminal mismanagement of potentially explosive enterprises," and sentenced to ten years imprisonment—of which he would serve five—for the role that his oversight of the experiment played in the ensuing accident. Serving under Dyatlov, Alexander Akimov was chief of the night shift, and Leonid Toptonov was the operator responsible for the reactor's operational regimen, including the movement of the control rods. Toptonov was a young engineer who had worked independently as a senior engineer for approximately three months. The test plan called for a gradual decrease in power output from reactor 4 to a thermal level of 700 to 1000 MW. An output of 700 MW was reached at 005 on 26 April. Due to the reactor's production of a fission byproduct, xenon-135, which is a reaction-inhibiting neutron absorber, core power continued to decrease in the absence of further operator action—a process known as reactor poisoning. In steady-state operation this is avoided because xenon-135 is burned off. As quickly as it is created from decaying iodine-135 by the absorption of neutrons from the ongoing chain reaction, becoming highly stable xenon-136. With the reactor power reduced, previously produced high quantities of iodine-135 were decaying into the neutron absorbing xenon-135 faster than the now reduced neutron flux could burn it off. As the reactor power output dropped further, to approximately 500 MW, the power suddenly fell into an unintended near shutdown state, with a power output of 30 MW thermal or less. The exact circumstances that caused the power fall are unknown because Akimov died in hospital on 10 May and Toptonov on 14 May. Early reports attributed it to Toptonov mistakenly inserting the control rods too far into the core, but it has also been suggested it was due to an equipment failure. The reactor was now producing 5% of the minimum initial power level prescribed for the test. Control room personnel decided to raise power by disconnecting most of the reactor control rods from the automatic control rod regulation system and manually extracting the majority of rods to their upper limits. Several minutes elapsed between their extraction and the point at which the power output began to increase and subsequently stabilize at 160 to 200 megawatts thermal, a much lower level than the prescribed 700 megawatts. The rapid reduction in the power during the initial shutdown, and the subsequent operation at a level of less than 200 MW led to increased poisoning of the reactor core by the accumulation of xenon-135. 
This prevented the rise of reactor power, and made it necessary to extract additional control rods from the reactor core in order to counteract the poisoning. The operation of the reactor at the low power level and high poisoning level was accompanied by unstable core temperatures and coolant flow, and possibly by instability of neutron flux, which triggered alarms. The control room received repeated emergency signals regarding the levels in the steam water separator drums, and large excursions or variations in the flow rate of feed water, as well as from relief valves opened to relieve excess steam into a turbine condenser, and from the neutron power controller. Between 0.35 and 0.45, emergency alarm signals concerning thermal hydraulic parameters were ignored, apparently to preserve the reactor power level. When a power level of 200 MW was re-attained, preparation for the experiment continued. As part of the test plan, extra water pumps were activated at 1.05 on 26 April, increasing the water flow. The increased coolant flow rate through the reactor produced an increase in the inlet coolant temperature of the reactor core the coolant no longer having sufficient time to release its heat in the turbine and cooling towers, which now more closely approached the nucleate boiling temperature of water, reducing the safety margin. The flow exceeded the allowed limit at 119, triggering an alarm of low steam pressure in the steam separators. At the same time, the extra water flow lowered the overall core temperature and reduced the existing steam voids in the core and the steam separators. Since water weakly absorbs neutrons and the higher density of liquid water makes it a better absorber than steam, the activation of the additional pumps decreased the reactor power. The crew responded by turning off two of the circulation pumps to reduce feed water flow, in an effort to increase steam pressure, and by removing more manual control rods to maintain power. The combined effect of these various actions was an extremely unstable reactor configuration. Nearly all of the 211 control rods had been extracted manually, including all but 18 of the Fail safe. Manually operated rods of the minimum 28 that were supposed to remain fully inserted to control the reactor even in the event of a loss of coolant. While the emergency scram system that would insert all control rods to shut down the reactor could still be activated manually through the AS5 button, the automated system that would ordinarily do the same had been mostly disabled to maintain the power level, and many other automated and even passive safety features of the reactor had been bypassed. The reduction of reactor coolant pumping left little safety margin, any power excursion could produce boiling, thereby reducing neutron absorption by the water. The reactor configuration was outside the safe operating envelope prescribed by the designers. If anything pushed it into supercriticality, it would be unable to recover automatically. Topic: Experiment and explosion. At 1.23, 4 a.m., the test began. Four of the main circulating pumps MCP were active. Of the eight total, six are normally active under regular operation. The steam to the turbines was shut off, beginning a rundown of the turbine generator. The diesel generators started and sequentially picked up loads, the generators were to have completely picked up the McPee's power needs by 1 hour 23 minutes and 43 seconds. In the interim, the power for the MCPs was to be supplied by the turbine generator as it coasted down. As the momentum of the turbine generator decreased, so did the power it produced for the pumps. 
the water flow rate decreased, leading to increased formation of steam voids bubbles in the core. Unlike western light water reactors, the RBMK had a positive void coefficient of reactivity at low power levels, meaning that when water began to boil and produce voids in the coolant, the nuclear chain reaction increased instead of decreasing. Given this characteristic, the number 4 RBMK reactor operation was now at risk of spiraling into a positive feedback loop, in which the formation of steam voids would reduce the ability of the liquid water coolant to absorb neutrons, increasing the reactor's power output, causing yet more water to flash into steam, and yielding a further power increase. Throughout most of the experiment the automatic control system successfully counteracted this positive feedback, inserting control rods into the reactor core to limit the power rise. However, this system had control of only 12 rods, as nearly all the others had been manually retracted. At 1 hour 23 minutes and 40 seconds, as recorded by the Scala centralized control system, a scram emergency shutdown of the reactor was initiated. The scram was started when the EPS-5 button, also known as the AS-5 button, of the reactor emergency protection system was pressed. This engaged the drive mechanism on all control rods to fully insert them, including the manual control rods that had been withdrawn earlier. The reason why the EPS-5 button was pressed is not known, whether it was done as an emergency measure in response to rising temperatures, or simply as a routine method of shutting down the reactor upon completion of the experiment. One view is that the scram may have been ordered as a response to the unexpected rapid power increase, although there is no recorded data showing this. Some have suggested that the button was not manually pressed, that the scram signal was automatically produced by the emergency protection system, but the Scala registered a manual scram signal. Despite this, the question as to when or even whether the EPS-5 button was pressed has been the subject of debate. There have been assertions that the manual scram was initiated due to the initial rapid power acceleration. Others have suggested that the button was not pressed until the reactor began to self-destruct, while others believe that it happened earlier and under calm conditions. When the EPS-5 button was pressed, the insertion of control rods into the reactor core began. The control rod insertion mechanism moved the rods at 0.4 meters per second, 1.3 feet per second, so that the rods took 18 to 20 seconds to travel the full height of the core, about 7 meters, 23 feet. A bigger problem was the design of the RBMK control rods, each of which had a graphite neutron moderator section attached to its end to boost reactor output by displacing water when the control rod section had been fully withdrawn from the reactor. That is, when a control rod was at maximum extraction, a neutron moderating graphite extension was centered in the core with 1.25 meters (4.1 feet) columns of water above and below it. Consequently, injecting a control rod downward into the reactor in a scram initially displaced neutron absorbing water in the lower portion of the reactor with neutron moderating graphite. Thus, an emergency scram initially increased the reaction rate in the lower part of the core as the graphite extensions of rods moving down in the reactor displaced water coolant. This behavior was discovered when the initial insertion of control rods in another RBMK reactor at Ignalina Nuclear Power Plant in 1983 induced a power spike, but as the subsequent scram of that reactor was successful, the subsequently disseminated information had been deemed of little importance. 
A few seconds into the scram, a power spike did occur and the core overheated, causing some of the fuel rods to fracture, blocking the control rod columns and jamming the control rods at one-third insertion, with the graphite water displacers still in the lower part of the core. Within three seconds the reactor output rose above 530 megawatts. The subsequent course of events was not registered by instruments, it has been reconstructed through mathematical simulation. Per the simulation, the power spike would have caused an increase in fuel temperature and steam buildup, leading to a rapid increase in steam pressure. This caused the fuel cladding to fail, releasing the fuel elements into the coolant, and rupturing the channels in which these elements were located. Then, according to some estimations, the reactor output jumped to around 30,000 MW thermal, 10 times its normal operational output. The last reading on the control panel was 33,000 MW. It was not possible to reconstruct the precise sequence of the processes that led to the destruction of the reactor and the power unit building, but a steam explosion, like the explosion of a steam boiler from excess vapor pressure, appears to have been the next event. There is a general understanding that it was explosive steam pressure from the damaged fuel channels escaping into the reactor's exterior cooling structure that caused the explosion that destroyed the reactor casing, tearing off and blasting the upper plate, to which the entire reactor assembly is fastened, through the roof of the reactor building. This is believed to be the first explosion that many heard. This explosion ruptured further fuel channels, as well as severing most of the coolant lines feeding the reactor chamber, and as a result the remaining coolant flashed to steam and escaped the reactor core. The total water loss in combination with a high positive void coefficient further increased the reactor's thermal power. A second, more powerful explosion occurred about two or three seconds after the first, this explosion dispersed the damaged core and effectively terminated the nuclear chain reaction. This explosion also compromised more of the reactor containment vessel and ejected hot lumps of graphite moderator. The ejected graphite and the demolished channels still in the remains of the reactor vessel caught fire on exposure to air, greatly contributing to the spread of radioactive fallout and the contamination of outlying areas. According to observers outside Unit 4, burning lumps of material and sparks shot into the air above the reactor. Some of them fell onto the roof of the machine hall and started a fire. About 25% of the red-hot graphite blocks and overheated material from the fuel channels was ejected. Parts of the graphite blocks and fuel channels were out of the reactor building. As a result of the damage to the building and airflow through the core was established by the high temperature of the core. The air ignited the hot graphite and started a graphite fire. After the larger explosion, a number of employees at the power station went outside to get a clearer view of the extent of the damage. One such survivor, Alexander Yuvchenko, recounts that once he stepped outside and looked up towards the reactor hall, he saw a very beautiful laser-like beam of light bluish light caused by the ionization of air that appeared to flood up into infinity. Because of the second explosion There were initially several hypotheses about the nature of the second explosion. One view was that the second explosion was caused by the combustion of hydrogen, which had been produced either by the overheated steam zirconium reaction or by the reaction of red-hot graphite with steam that produced hydrogen and carbon monoxide. 
Another hypothesis, by Chechrev, published in 1998, was that the second explosion was a thermal explosion of the reactor as a result of the uncontrollable escape of fast neutrons caused by the complete water loss in the reactor core. A third hypothesis was that the second explosion was another steam explosion. According to this version, the first explosion was a more minor steam explosion in the circulating loop, causing a loss of coolant flow and pressure that in turn caused the water still in the core to flash to steam. This second explosion then caused the majority of the damage to the reactor and containment building. The force of the second explosion and the ratio of xenon radioisotopes released after the accident a vital tool in nuclear forensics indicated to Yuri V. Dubasov in a 2009 publication suggested before him by Chechrev in 1998, that the second explosion could have been a nuclear power transient resulting from core material melting in the absence of its water coolant and moderator. Dubasov argues that the reactor did not simply undergo a runaway delayed supercritical, exponential increase in power into the multi-gigawatt power range. This permitted a dangerous, positive feedback runaway condition, given the lack of inherent safety stops when power levels began to increase above the commercial level, although a positive feedback power excursion that increased until the reactor disassembled itself by means of its internal energy and external steam explosions is the more accepted explanation for the cause of the explosions. Dubasov argues instead that a runaway prompt supercriticality occurred, with the internal physics being more similar to the explosion of a fizzled nuclear weapon, and that this failed, fizzle event produced the second explosion. This nuclear fizzle hypothesis, then mostly defended by Dubasov, was examined further in 2017 by retired physicist Lars Eric de Geer in an analysis that puts the hypothesized fizzle event as the more probable cause of the first explosion. The more energetic second explosion, which produced the majority of the damage, has been estimated by Dubasov in 2009 as equivalent to 40 billion joules of energy, the equivalent of about 10 tons of TNT. Both the 2009 and 2017 analyses argue that the nuclear fizzle event, whether producing the second or first explosion, consisted of a prompt chain reaction as opposed to the consensus delayed neutron mediated chain reaction that was limited to a small portion of the reactor core, since expected self disassembly occurs rapidly in fizzle events. Topic. Fire Contrary to safety regulations, bitumen, a combustible material, had been used in the construction of the roof of the reactor building and the turbine hall. Ejected material ignited at least five fires on the roof of the adjacent reactor 3, which was still operating. It was imperative to put those fires out and protect the cooling systems of Reactor 3. Inside Reactor 3, the chief of the night shift, Yuri Bagdasarov, wanted to shut down the reactor immediately, but chief engineer Nikolai Faman would not allow this. The operators were given respirators and potassium iodide tablets and told to continue working. At 5 o'clock, Bagdasarov made his own decision to shut down the reactor, leaving only those operators there who had to work the emergency cooling systems. Topic. Radiation levels The ionizing radiation levels in the worst hit areas of the reactor building have been estimated to be 5.6 rentgens per second R, S, equivalent to more than 20,000 rentgens per hour. 
A lethal dose is around 500 rentgens, approximately 5 gray GY in modern radiation units over 5 hours, so in some areas, unprotected workers received fatal doses in less than a minute. However, a dosimeter capable of measuring up to 1000 R.S. was buried in the rubble of a collapsed part of the building, and another one failed when turned on. All remaining dosimeters had limits of 0.001 R.S. and therefore read, off scale. Thus, the reactor crew could ascertain only that the radiation levels were somewhere above 0.001 R.S. 3.6 R.H., while the true levels were much higher in some areas. Because of the inaccurate low readings, the reactor crew chief Alexander Akimov assumed that the reactor was intact. The evidence of pieces of graphite and reactor fuel lying around the building was ignored, and the readings of another dosimeter brought in by 430 were dismissed under the assumption that the new dosimeter must have been defective. Akimov stayed with his crew in the reactor building until morning, sending members of his crew to try to pump water into the reactor. None of them wore any protective gear. Most, including Akimov, died from radiation exposure within three weeks. Topic. Immediate crisis management Topic. Fire containment Shortly after the accident, at 1.45, firefighters arrived to try to extinguish the fires. First on the scene was a Chernobyl Power Station firefighter brigade under the command of Lieutenant Volodymyr Pravik, who died on 9 May 1986 of acute radiation sickness. They were not told how dangerous radioactive the smoke and the debris were, and may not even have known that the accident was anything more than a regular electrical fire. We didn't know it was the reactor. No one had told us. Grigory Kamel, the driver of one of the fire engines, later described what happened. We arrived there at 10 or 15 minutes to 2 in the morning. We saw graphite scattered about. Misha asked. Is that graphite? I kicked it away. But one of the fighters on the other truck picked it up. It's hot, he said. The pieces of graphite were of different sizes, some big, some small, enough to pick them up. We didn't know much about radiation. Even those who worked there had no idea. There was no water left in the trucks. Misha filled a cistern and we aimed the water at the top. Then those boys who died went up to the roof. Vashchik. Kolya and others, and Velodia Pravik. They went up the ladder, and I never saw them again. Anatoly Zakharov, a fireman stationed in Chernobyl since 1980, offers a different description in 2008. I remember joking to the others, there must be an incredible amount of radiation here. We'll be lucky if we're all still alive in the morning. He also stated. Of course we knew. If we'd followed regulations, we would never have gone near the reactor. But it was a moral obligation. Our duty. We were like kamikaze. The immediate priority was to extinguish fires on the roof of the station and the area around the building containing reactor number 4 to protect number 3 and keep its core cooling systems intact. 
The fires were extinguished by 5 o'clock, but many firefighters received high doses of radiation. The fire inside Reactor 4 continued to burn until 10 May 1986. It is possible that well over half of the graphite burned out. The fire was extinguished by a combined effort of helicopters dropping over 5,000 metric tons, 4,900 long tons, 5,500 short tons of sand, lead, clay, and neutron-absorbing boron onto the burning reactor and injection of liquid nitrogen. It is now known that virtually none of the neutron absorbers reached the core. Historians estimate that about 600 Soviet pilots risked dangerous levels of radiation to fly the thousands of flights needed to cover reactor number 4 in this attempt to seal off radiation. From eyewitness accounts of the firefighters involved before they died, as reported on the CBC television series Witness, one described his experience of the radiation as tasting like metal and feeling a sensation similar to that of pins and needles all over his face. This is similar to the description given by Louis Slotin, a Manhattan Project physicist who died days after a fatal radiation overdose from a criticality accident. The explosion and fire threw hot particles of the nuclear fuel and also far more dangerous fission products, radioactive isotopes such as cesium-137, iodine-131, strontium-90, and other radionuclides, into the air. The residents of the surrounding area observed the radioactive cloud on the night of the explosion. Equipment assembled included remote-controlled bulldozers and robot carts that could detect radioactivity and carry hot debris. Valery Legasov, first deputy director of the Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy in Moscow, said in 1987, But we learned that robots are not the great remedy for everything. Where there was very high radiation, the robot ceased to be a robot. The electronics quit working. Topic. Evacuation The nearby city of Pripyat was not immediately evacuated. The townspeople, in the early hours of the morning, at 1.23 local time, went about their usual business, completely oblivious to what had just happened. However, within a few hours of the explosion, dozens of people fell ill. Later, they reported severe headaches and metallic tastes in their mouths, along with uncontrollable fits of coughing and vomiting. As the plant was run by authorities in Moscow, the government of Ukraine did not receive prompt information on the accident. Valentina Shevchenko, then chairman of the Presidium of Verkhovna Rada Supreme Soviet of the Ukrainian SSR, recalls that Ukraine's acting minister of internal affairs Vasil Derdinets phoned her at work at 9 o'clock to report current affairs. Only at the end of the conversation did he add that there had been a fire at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant plant, but it was extinguished and everything was fine. When Shevchenko asked, How are the people? He replied that there was nothing to be concerned about. Some are celebrating a wedding, others are gardening, and others are fishing in the Pripyat River. Shevchenko then spoke over the phone to Volodymyr Sherbitsky, head of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine and de facto head of state, who said he anticipated a delegation of the State Commission headed by the Deputy Chairman of the Council of Ministers of USSR. A commission was established later in the day to investigate the accident. 
It was headed by Valery Legasov, first deputy director of the Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy, and included leading nuclear specialist Yevgeny Velikov, hydro meteorologist Yuri Israel, radiologist Leonid Ilyan, and others. They flew to Borispol International Airport and arrived at the power plant in the evening of 26 April. By that time two people had already died and 52 were hospitalized. The delegation soon had ample evidence that the reactor was destroyed and extremely high levels of radiation had caused a number of cases of radiation exposure. In the early daylight hours of 27 April, approximately 36 hours after the initial blast, they ordered the evacuation of Pripyat. Initially it was decided to evacuate the population for three days, later this was made permanent. By 11 o'clock on 27 April, buses had arrived in Pripyat to start the evacuation. The evacuation began at 1400. A translated excerpt of the evacuation announcement follows For the attention of the residents of Pripyat. The city council informs you that due to the accident at Chernobyl power station in the city of Pripyat the radioactive conditions in the vicinity are deteriorating. The Communist Party, its officials and the armed forces are taking necessary steps to combat this. Nevertheless, with the view to keep people as safe and healthy as possible, the children being top priority, we need to temporarily evacuate the citizens in the nearest towns of Kiev region. For these reasons, starting from 27 April 1986, 1400 each apartment block will be able to have a bus at its disposal, supervised by the police and the city officials. It is highly advisable to take your documents, some vital personal belongings and a certain amount of food, just in case, with you. The senior executives of public and industrial facilities of the city has decided on the list of employees needed to stay in Pripyat to maintain these facilities in a good working order. All the houses will be guarded by the police during the evacuation period. Comrades, leaving your residences temporarily please make sure you have turned off the lights, electrical equipment and water and shut the windows. Please keep calm and orderly in the process of this short-term evacuation. To expedite the evacuation, residents were told to bring only what was necessary, and that they would remain evacuated for approximately three days. As a result, most personal belongings were left behind, and remain there today. By 1500, 53,000 people were evacuated to various villages of the Kiev region. The next day, talks began for evacuating people from the 10-kilometer zone. Ten days after the accident, the evacuation area was expanded to 30 kilometers 19 miles. This exclusion zone has remained ever since, although its shape has changed and its size has been expanded. Topic. Delayed announcement Evacuation began long before the accident was publicly acknowledged by the Soviet Union. In the morning of 28 April, radiation levels set off alarms at the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden, over 1,000 kilometers 620 miles from the Chernobyl plant. Workers at Forsmark reported the case to the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority, which determined that the radiation had originated elsewhere. That day, the Swedish government contacted the Soviet government to inquire about whether there had been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. 
The Soviets initially denied it, and it was only after the Swedish government suggested they were about to file an official alert with the IAEA, that the Soviet government admitted an accident took place at Chernobyl. At first, the Soviets only conceded that a minor accident had occurred, but once they began evacuating over 100,000 people, the full scale of the situation was realized by the global community. At 21.02 the evening of 28 April, a 22nd announcement was read in the TV news program Vremia. There has been an accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. One of the nuclear reactors was damaged. The effects of the accident are being remedied. Assistance has been provided for any affected people. An investigative commission has been set up. This was the entirety of the announcement of the accident. The Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union TASS, then discussed Three Mile Island and other American nuclear accidents, an example of the common Soviet tactic of emphasizing foreign disasters when one occurred in the Soviet Union. The mention of a commission, however, indicated to observers the seriousness of the incident, and subsequent state radio broadcasts were replaced with classical music, which was a common method of preparing the public for an announcement of a tragedy. Around the same time, ABC News released its report about the disaster. Shevchenko was the first of the Ukrainian state top officials to arrive at the disaster site early on 28 April. There she spoke with members of medical staff and people, who were calm and hopeful that they could soon return to their homes. Shevchenko returned home near midnight, stopping at a radiological checkpoint in Vilcha, one of the first that were set up soon after the accident. There was a notification from Moscow that there was no reason to postpone the 1st of May International Workers' Day celebrations in Kiev, including the annual parade, but on the 30th of April a meeting of the Political Bureau of the Central Committee of the CPSU took place to discuss discuss the plan for the upcoming celebration. Scientists were reporting that the radiological background level in Kiev was normal. At the meeting, which was finished at 1800, it was decided to shorten celebrations from the regular 3.5 to 4 hours to under 2 hours. Several buildings in Pripyat were officially kept open after the disaster to be used by workers still involved with the plant. These included the Jupiter factory which closed in 1996 and the Azure swimming pool, used by the liquidators for recreation during the cleanup, which closed in 1998. Topic. Steam explosion risk Two floors of bubbler pools beneath the reactor served as a large water reservoir for the emergency cooling pumps and as a pressure suppression system capable of condensing steam in case of a small broken steam pipe. The third floor above them, below the reactor, served as a steam tunnel. The steam released by a broken pipe was supposed to enter the steam tunnel and be led into the pools to bubble through a layer of water. After the disaster, the pools and the basement were flooded because of ruptured cooling water pipes and accumulated firefighting water, and constituted a serious steam explosion risk. The smoldering graphite, fuel and other material above, at more than 1,200 degrees Celsius 2,190 degrees Fahrenheit, started to burn through the reactor floor and mixed with molten concrete from the reactor lining, creating corium, a radioactive semi-liquid material comparable to lava. If this mixture had melted through the floor into the pool of water, it was feared it could have created a serious steam explosion that would have ejected more radioactive material from the reactor. 
It became necessary to drain the pool, the bubbler pool could be drained by opening its sluice gates. However, the valves controlling it were underwater, located in a flooded corridor in the basement. Volunteers in wetsuits and respirators for protection against radioactive aerosols and equipped with dosimeters, entered the knee-deep radioactive water and managed to open the valves. These were the engineers Alexei Anonenko and Valery Bezpilov who knew where the valves were, accompanied by the shift supervisor Boris Baranov. Upon succeeding, all risk of a further steam explosion was eliminated. All three men were awarded the Order for Courage by Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko in May 2018. Research by Andrew Leatherbarrow, author of Chernobyl 1 hour 23 minutes and 40 seconds, determined that the frequently recounted story, which suggests that all three men died just days after the incident, is false. Alexei Anonenko continues to work in the nuclear energy industry, and rebuffs the growth of the Chernobyl media sensationalism surrounding him. While Valery Bezpilov was found to still be alive by Leatherbarrow, the 65-year-old Baranov had lived until 2005 and had died of heart failure. Once the bubbler pool gates were opened by the Anonenko team, fire brigade pumps were then used to drain the basement. The operation was not completed until 8 May, after 20,000 metric tons, 20,000 long tons, 22,000 short tons of highly radioactive water were pumped out. With the bubbler pool gone, a meltdown was less likely to produce a powerful steam explosion. To do so, the molten core would now have to reach the water table below the reactor. To reduce the likelihood of this, it was decided to freeze the earth beneath the reactor, which would also stabilize the foundations. Using oil well drilling equipment, the injection of liquid nitrogen began on 4 May. It was estimated that 25 metric tons of liquid nitrogen per day would be required to keep the soil frozen at minus 100 degrees Celsius minus 148 degrees Fahrenheit. This idea was soon scrapped. As an alternative, coal miners were deployed to excavate a tunnel below the reactor. From there the bottom room where the cooling system would have been installed, was filled with concrete to strengthen the foundation below the reactor. It is likely that intense alpha radiation hydrolyzed the water, generating a low pH hydrogen peroxide H2O2, solution akin to an oxidizing acid. Conversion of bubbler pool water to H2O2 is confirmed by the presence in the Chernobyl lavas of stutite and metastutite, the only minerals that contain peroxide. Topic: <inaudible> Debris removal. In the months after the explosion, attention turned to removing the radioactive debris from the roof. The worst of the radioactive debris was collected inside what was left of the reactor, however it was estimated that there was approximately 100 tons of debris on that roof that resulted from the explosion and which had to be removed to enable the safe construction of the sarcophagus, a concrete structure which would entomb the reactor and reduce radioactive dust being released into the atmosphere. The initial plan was to use robots to clear the debris off the roof. The Soviets used approximately 60 remote-controlled robots, most of them built in the Soviet Union although many failed due to the effect of high levels of radiation on their electronic controls. Consequently, the most highly radioactive materials were shoveled by Chernobyl liquidators from the military wearing heavy protective gear, dubbed bio-robots. 
By the military, these soldiers could only spend a maximum of 40 to 90 seconds working on the rooftops of the surrounding buildings because of the extremely high doses of radiation given off by the blocks of graphite and other debris. Though the soldiers were only supposed to perform the role of the bio-robot a maximum of once, some soldiers reported having done this task five or six times. Only 10% of the debris cleared from the roof was performed by robots with the other 90% removed by approximately 5,000 men who absorbed, on average, an estimated dose of 25 rem 250 millisieverts of radiation each. At the time there was still fear that the reactor could re-enter a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction and explode again, and a new containment structure was planned to to prevent rain entering and triggering such an explosion, and to prevent further release of radioactive material. This was the largest civil engineering task in history, involving a quarter of a million construction workers who all reached their official lifetime limits of radiation. Ukrainian filmmaker Vladimir Shevchenko captured film footage of an Mi-8 helicopter as its main rotor collided with a nearby construction crane cable, causing the helicopter to fall near the damaged reactor building and killing its four-man crew on 2 October 1986. By December 1986, a large concrete sarcophagus had been erected to seal off the reactor and its contents. A unique, clean up medal was given to the workers. Although many of the radioactive emergency vehicles were buried in trenches, many of the vehicles used by the liquidators, including the helicopters, still remain parked in a field in the Chernobyl area. Scavengers have since removed many functioning, but highly radioactive, parts. Liquidators worked under deplorable conditions, poorly informed and with poor protection. Many, if not most of them, exceeded radiation safety limits. Some exceeded limits by over 100 times leading to rapid death. During the construction of the sarcophagus, a scientific team re entered the reactor as part of an investigation dubbed Complex Expedition to locate and contain nuclear fuel in a way that could not lead to another explosion. These scientists manually collected cold fuel rods, but great heat was still emanating from the core. Rates of radiation in different parts of the building were monitored by drilling holes into the reactor and inserting long metal detector tubes. The scientists were exposed to high levels of radiation and radioactive dust. After six months of investigation, in December 1986, they discovered with the help of a remote camera an intensely radioactive mass in the basement of Unit 4, more than two meters wide, which they called the elephant's foot for its wrinkled appearance. The mass was composed of melted sand, concrete and a large amount of nuclear fuel that had escaped from the reactor. The concrete beneath the reactor was steaming hot, and was breached by now solidified lava and spectacular unknown crystalline forms termed Chernobylite. It was concluded that there was no further risk of explosion. The official contaminated zones became staged to a massive cleanup effort lasting seven months. The official reason for such early and dangerous decontamination efforts, rather than allowing time for natural decay, was that the land must be re peopled and brought back into cultivation. Indeed, within 15 months 75% of the land was under cultivation, even though only a third of the evacuated villages were resettled. Defense forces must have done much of the work. Yet this land was of marginal agricultural value. 
According to historian David Marples, the administration had a psychological purpose for the cleanup, they wished to forestall panic regarding nuclear energy, and even to restart the Chernobyl power station. Topic. Causes Topic. INSAG-1 Report, 1986 The first official explanation of the accident, later acknowledged to be erroneous, was published in August 1986. It effectively placed the blame on the power plant operators. To investigate the causes of the accident the IAEA created a group known as the International Nuclear Safety Advisory Group INSAG, which in its report of 1986, INSAG-1, on the whole also supported this view, based on the data provided by the Soviets and the oral statements of specialists. In this view, the catastrophic accident was caused by gross violations of operating rules and regulations. During preparation and testing of the turbine generator under rundown conditions using the auxiliary load, personnel disconnected a series of technical protection systems and breached the most important operational safety provisions for conducting a technical exercise." The operator error was probably due to their lack of knowledge of nuclear reactor physics and engineering, as well as lack of experience and training. According to these allegations, at the time of the accident the reactor was being operated with many key safety systems turned off, most notably the Emergency Core Cooling System ECCS, LAR, Local Automatic Control System, and AS, Emergency Power Reduction System. Personnel had an insufficiently detailed understanding of technical procedures involved with the nuclear reactor, and knowingly ignored regulations to speed test completion. The developers of the reactor plant considered this combination of events to be impossible and therefore did not allow for the creation of emergency protection systems capable of preventing the combination of events that led to the crisis, namely the intentional disabling of emergency protection equipment plus the violation of operating procedures. Thus the primary cause of the accident was the extremely improbable combination of rule infringement plus the operational routine allowed by the power station staff. In this analysis of the causes of the accident, deficiencies in the reactor design and in the operating regulations that made the accident possible were set aside and mentioned only casually. Serious critical observations covered only general questions and did not address the specific reasons for the accident. The following general picture arose from these observations, and several procedural irregularities also helped to make the accident possible, one of which was insufficient communication between the safety officers and the operators in charge of the experiment being run that night. The reactor operators disabled safety systems down to the generators, which the test was really about. The main process computer, Scala, was running in such a way that the main control computer could not shut down the reactor or even reduce power. Normally the computer would have started to insert all of the control rods. The computer would have also started the emergency core protection system that introduces 24 control rods into the active zone within 2.5 seconds which is still slow by 1986 standards all control was transferred from the process computer to the human operators on the subject of the disconnection of safety systems valery legasov said in 1987 
It was like airplane pilots experimenting with the engines in flight. This view is reflected in numerous publications and also artistic works on the theme of the Chernobyl accident that appeared immediately after the accident, and for a long time remained dominant in the public consciousness and in popular publications. Topic. INSAG-7 Report, 1992 Ukraine has declassified a number of KGB documents from the period between 1971 and 1988 related to the Chernobyl plant, mentioning for example previous reports of structural damages caused by negligence during construction of the plant such as splitting of concrete layers that were never acted upon. They document over 29 emergency situations in the plant during this period, eight of which were caused by negligence or poor competence on the part of personnel. In 1991, a commission of the USSR State Committee for the Supervision of Safety in Industry and Nuclear Power reassessed the causes and circumstances of the Chernobyl accident and came to new insights and conclusions. Based on it, in 1992 the IAEA Nuclear Safety Advisory Group INSAG, published an additional report, INSAG-7, which reviewed that part of the INSAG-1 report in which primary attention is given to the reasons for the accident and was included the USSR State Commission report as Appendix I in this INSAG report. Most of the earlier accusations against staff for breach of regulations were acknowledged to be either erroneous, based on incorrect information obtained in August 1986, or less relevant. This report reflected a different view of the main reasons for the accident, presented in Appendix I. According to this account, the operator's actions in turning off the emergency core cooling system, interfering with the settings on the protection equipment, and blocking the level and pressure in the separator drum did not contribute to the original cause of the accident and its magnitude, although they may have been a breach of regulations. In fact, Turning off the emergency system designed to prevent the two turbine generators from stopping was not a violation of regulations. Human factors, however, contributed to the conditions that led to the disaster. These included operating the reactor at a low power level less than 700 megawatts a level documented in the run-down test program, and operating with a small operational reactivity margin ORM. The 1986 assertions of Soviet experts notwithstanding, regulations did not prohibit operating the reactor at this low power level, however, regulations did forbid operating the reactor with a small margin of reactivity. Yet. Post-accident studies have shown that the way in which the real role of the ORM is reflected in the operating procedures and design documentation for the RBMK-1000 is extremely contradictory. And furthermore, ORM was not treated as an operational safety limit, violation of which could lead to an accident. According to the INSAG-7 report, the chief reasons for the accident lie in the peculiarities of physics and in the construction of the reactor. There are two such reasons. The reactor had a dangerously large positive void coefficient of reactivity. The void coefficient is a measurement of how a reactor responds to increased steam formation in the water coolant. Most other reactor designs have a negative coefficient, i.e. the nuclear reaction rate slows when steam bubbles form in the coolant, since as the vapor phase in the reactor increases, fewer neutrons are slowed down. 
Faster neutrons are less likely to split uranium atoms, so the reactor produces less power, a negative feedback. Chernobyl's RBMK reactor, however, used solid graphite as a neutron moderator to slow down the neutrons, and the water in it, on the contrary, acts like a harmful neutron absorber. Thus neutrons are slowed down even if steam bubbles form in the water. Furthermore, because steam absorbs neutrons much less readily than water, increasing the intensity of vaporization means that more neutrons are able to split uranium atoms, increasing the reactor's power output. This makes the RBMK design very unstable at low power levels, and prone to suddenly increasing energy production to a dangerous level. This behavior is counterintuitive, and this property of the reactor was unknown to the crew. A more significant flaw was in the design of the control rods that are inserted into the reactor to slow down the reaction. In the RBMK reactor design, the lower part of each control rod was made of graphite and was 1.3 meters (4.3 feet) shorter than necessary, and in the space beneath the rods were hollow channels filled with water. The upper part of the rod, the truly functional part that absorbs the neutrons and thereby halts the reaction, was made of boron carbide. With this design, when the rods are inserted into the reactor from the uppermost position, the graphite parts initially displace some water, which absorbs neutrons, as mentioned above, effectively causing fewer neutrons to be absorbed initially. Thus for the first few seconds of control rod activation, reactor power output is increased, rather than reduced as desired. This behavior is counterintuitive and was not known to the reactor operators. Other deficiencies besides these were noted in the RBMK 1000 reactor design, as were its non compliance with accepted standards and with the requirements of nuclear reactor safety. While INSAG-1 and INSAG-7 reports both identified operator error as an issue of concern, the INSAG-7 identified that there were numerous other issues that were contributing factors that led to the incident. These contributing factors include the plant was not designed to safety standards in effect and incorporated unsafe features. Inadequate safety analysis was performed. There was insufficient attention to independent safety review. Operating procedures not founded satisfactorily in safety analysis. Safety information not adequately and effectively communicated between operators, and between operators and designers. The operators did not adequately understand safety aspects of the plant. Operators did not sufficiently respect formal requirements of operational and test procedures. The regulatory regime was insufficient to effectively counter pressures for production. There was a general lack of safety culture in nuclear matters at the national level as well as locally. Topic. Analysis Both views were heavily lobbied by different groups, including the reactor's designers, power plant personnel, and the Soviet and Ukrainian governments. According to the IAEA's 1986 analysis, the main cause of the accident was the operator's actions. But according to the IAEA's 1993 revised analysis the main cause was the reactor's design. 
One reason there were such contradictory viewpoints and so much debate about the causes of the Chernobyl accident was that the primary data covering the disaster, as registered by the instruments and sensors, were not completely published in the official sources. Once again, the human factor had to be considered as a major element in causing the accident. INSAG notes that both the operating regulations and staff handled the disabling of the reactor protection easily enough, witness the length of time for which the ECCS was out of service while the reactor was operated at half power. INSAG's view is that it was the operating crew's deviation from the test program that was mostly to blame. Most reprehensibly, unapproved changes in the test procedure were deliberately made on the spot, although the plant was known to be in a very different condition from that intended for the test. As in the previously released report INSAG 1, close attention is paid in report INSAG 7 to the inadequate at the moment of the accident culture of safety. At all levels, deficiency in the safety culture was inherent not only at the operational stage but also, and to no lesser extent, during activities at other stages in the lifetime of nuclear power plants including design, engineering, construction, manufacture, and regulation. The poor quality of operating procedures and instructions, and their conflicting character, put a heavy burden on the operating crew, including the chief engineer. The accident can be said to have flowed from a deficient safety culture, not only at the Chernobyl plant, but throughout the Soviet design, operating and regulatory organizations for nuclear power that existed at that time. Topic. Environmental effects Topic. Spread of radioactive substances Although no informing comparisons can be made between the accident and a strictly air-burst fused nuclear detonation, it has still been approximated that about 400 times more radioactive material was released from Chernobyl than by the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By contrast the Chernobyl accident released about one hundredth to one thousandth of the total amount of radioactivity released during the era of nuclear weapons testing at the height of the Cold War, 1950-1960s, with the one one hundredth to one one thousandth variants due to trying to make comparisons with different spectrums of isotopes released. Approximately 100,000 square kilometers (39,000 square miles) of land was significantly contaminated with fallout, with the worst hit regions being in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Slighter levels of contamination were detected over all of Europe except for the Iberian Peninsula. The initial evidence that a major release of radioactive material was affecting other countries came not from Soviet sources, but from Sweden. On the morning of 28 April, workers at the Forsmark nuclear power plant approximately 1,100 kilometers 680 miles from the Chernobyl site were found to have radioactive particles on their clothes. It was Sweden's search for the source of radioactivity, after they had determined there was no leak at the Swedish plant, that at noon on 28 April led to the first hint of a serious nuclear problem in the Western Soviet Union. Hence the evacuation of Pripyat on 27 April 36 hours after the initial explosions, was silently completed before the disaster became known outside the Soviet Union. The rise in radiation levels had at that time already been measured in Finland, but a civil service strike delayed the response and publication. 
Contamination from the Chernobyl accident was scattered irregularly depending on weather conditions, much of it deposited on mountainous regions such as the Alps, the Welsh Mountains and the Scottish Highlands, where adiabatic cooling caused radioactive rainfall. The resulting patches of contamination were often highly localized, and water flows across the ground contributed further to large variations in radioactivity over small areas. Sweden and Norway also received heavy fallout when the contaminated air collided with a cold front, bringing rain. There was also groundwater contamination. Rain was purposely seeded over 10,000 square kilometers, 3,900 square miles of the Belarusian SSR by the Soviet Air Force to remove radioactive particles from clouds heading toward highly populated areas. Heavy black-colored rain fell on the city of Gomel. Reports from Soviet and Western scientists indicate that Belarus received about 60% of the contamination that fell on the former Soviet Union. However, the 2006 Torch report stated that half of the volatile particles had landed outside Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. A large area in Russia south of Bryansk was also contaminated, as were parts of northwestern Ukraine. Studies in surrounding countries indicate that over one million people could have been affected by radiation. Recently published data from a long term monitoring program, the Korma Report 2, shows a decrease in internal radiation exposure of the inhabitants of a region in Belarus close to Gomel. Resettlement may even be possible in prohibited areas provided that people comply with appropriate dietary rules. In Western Europe, precautionary measures taken in response to the radiation included seemingly arbitrary regulations banning the importation of certain foods but not others. In France some officials stated that the Chernobyl accident had no adverse effects. Official figures in southern Bavaria in Germany indicated that some wild plant species contained substantial levels of cesium, which were believed to have been passed onto them during their consumption by wild boars, a significant number of which already contained radioactive particles above the allowed level. Topic: <laughs> Radioactive release. Like many other releases of radioactivity into the environment, the Chernobyl release was controlled by the physical and chemical properties of the radioactive elements in the core. Particularly dangerous are the highly radioactive fission products, those with high nuclear decay rates that accumulate in the food chain, such as some of the isotopes of iodine, cesium and strontium. Iodine-131 and cesium-137 are responsible for most of the radiation exposure received by the general population. Detailed reports on the release of radioisotopes from the site were published in 1989 and 1995, with the latter report updated in 2002. At different times after the accident, different isotopes were responsible for the majority of the external dose. The remaining quantity of any radioisotope, and therefore the activity of that isotope, after seven decay half-lives have passed, is less than 1% of its initial magnitude, and it continues to reduce beyond 0.78% after seven half-lives to 0.10% remaining after ten half-lives have passed and so on. Some radionuclides have decay products that are likewise radioactive, which is not accounted for here. The release of radioisotopes from the nuclear fuel was largely controlled by their boiling points, and the majority of the radioactivity present in the core was retained in the reactor. 
All of the noble gases, including krypton and xenon, contained within the reactor were released immediately into the atmosphere by the first steam explosion. The atmospheric release of xenon-133, with a half-life of five days, is estimated at 5,200 pbq. 50 to 60 percent of all core radioiodine in the reactor, about 1760 pbq, 1760 times 1015 becquerels, or about 0.4 kilograms, 0.88 pounds, was released as a mixture of sublimed vapor, solid particles, and organic iodine compounds. Iodine-131 has a half-life of 8 days. 20-40% of all coarse cesium-137 was released, 85 pbq in all. Cesium was released in aerosol form, cesium-137, along with isotopes of strontium, are the two primary elements preventing the Chernobyl exclusion zone being re-inhabited. 8, 5 times 1016 becquerels equals 24 kilograms of cesium-137. CS-137 has a half-life of 30 years. Tellurium-132, half-life 78 hours, an estimated 1150 pbq was released. An early estimate for total nuclear fuel material released to the environment was 3 plus or minus 1.5%, this was later revised to 3.5 plus or minus 0.5%. This corresponds to the atmospheric emission of 6 metric tons, 5.9 long tons, 6.6 .6 short tons of fragmented fuel. Two sizes of particles were released, small particles of 0.3 to 1.5 micrometers, each an individually unrecognizable small dust or smog-sized particulate matter and larger settling dust-sized particles that therefore were quicker to fall out of the air, of 10 micrometers in diameter. These larger particles contained about 80% to 90% of the released high boiling point or non-volatile radioisotopes, zirconium-95, niobium-95, lanthanum-140, cerium-144 and the transuranic elements, including neptunium, plutonium and the minor actinides, embedded in a uranium oxide matrix. The dose that was calculated is the relative external gamma dose rate for a person standing in the open. The exact dose to a person in the real world who would spend most of their time sleeping indoors in a shelter and then venturing out to consume an internal dose from the inhalation or ingestion of a radioisotope, requires a personnel-specific radiation dose reconstruction analysis. Topic. Environmental residual radioactivity Topic. Water bodies The Chernobyl nuclear power plant is located next to the Pripyat River, which feeds into the Dnieper Reservoir System, one of the largest surface water systems in Europe, which at the time supplied water to Kiev's 2.4 million residents, and was still in spring flood when the accident occurred. The radioactive contamination of aquatic systems therefore became a major problem in the immediate aftermath of the accident. In the most affected areas of Ukraine, levels of radioactivity, particularly from radionuclides 131I, 137Cs and 90 senior in drinking water caused concern during the weeks and months after the accident, though officially it was stated that all contaminants had settled to the bottom in an insoluble phase and would not dissolve for 800 to 1000 years 
Guidelines for levels of radioiodine in drinking water were temporarily raised to 3,700 becquerels per liter, allowing most water to be reported as safe, and a year after the accident it was announced that even the water of the Chernobyl plant's cooling pond was within acceptable norms. Despite this, Two months after the disaster the Kiev water supply was abruptly switched from the Dnieper to the Desna River. Meanwhile, massive silt traps were constructed, along with an enormous 30-meter deep underground barrier to prevent groundwater from the destroyed reactor entering the Pripyat River. Bioaccumulation of radioactivity in fish resulted in concentrations both in Western Europe and in the former Soviet Union that in many cases were significantly above guideline maximum levels for consumption. Guideline maximum levels for radiocesium in fish vary from country to country but are approximately 1,000 becquerels per kilogram in the European Union. In the Kiev Reservoir in Ukraine, concentrations in fish were several thousand becquerel per kilogram during the years after the accident. In small, closed Lakes in Belarus and the Bryansk region of Russia, concentrations in a number of fish species varied from 100 to 60,000 becquerels per kilogram during the period 1990–92. The contamination of fish caused short-term concern in parts of the UK and Germany and in the long term, years rather than months in the affected areas of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia as well as in parts of Scandinavia. Groundwater was not badly affected by the Chernobyl accident since radionuclides with short half-lives decayed away long before they could affect groundwater supplies, and longer-lived radionuclides such as radiocesium and radiostrontium were adsorbed to surface soils before they could transfer to groundwater. However, significant transfers of radionuclides to groundwater have occurred from waste disposal sites in the 30 km exclusion zone around Chernobyl. Although there is a potential for transfer of radionuclides from these disposal sites off-site, i.e. out of the 30 kilometers (19 miles) exclusion zone, the IAEA Chernobyl report argues that this is not significant in comparison to current levels of washout of surface deposited radioactivity. Topic Flora and fauna After the disaster, 4 square kilometers, 1.5 square miles of pine forest directly downwind of the reactor turned reddish brown and died, earning the name of the Red Forest. Some animals in the worst hit areas also died or stopped reproducing. Most domestic animals were removed from the exclusion zone, but horses left on an island in the Pripyat River 6 km 4 miles from the power plant died when their thyroid glands were destroyed by radiation doses of 150 to 200 sieverts. Some cattle on the same island died and those that survived were stunted because of thyroid damage. The next generation appeared to be normal. A robot sent into the reactor itself has returned with samples of black, melanin-rich radiotrophic fungi that are growing on the reactor's walls. Of the 440,350 wild boar killed in the 2010 hunting season in Germany, approximately 1,000 were contaminated with levels of radiation above the permitted limit of 600 becquerels of cesium per kilogram, due to residual radioactivity from Chernobyl. While all animal meat contains a natural level of potassium-40 at a similar level of activity, with both wild and farm animals in Italy containing 415 plus or minus 56 becquerels kilogram minus 1 dW. 
of that naturally occurring gamma emitter. The cesium contamination issue has historically reached some uniquely isolated and high levels approaching 20,000 becquerels of cesium per kilogram in some specific tests, however as it has not been observed in the wild boar population of Fukushima after the 2011 accident. Evidence exists to suggest that the wild German and Ukrainian boar population are in a unique location where they have subsisted on a diet high in plant or fungi sources that biomagnifies or concentrates radio cesium, with the most well-known food source the consumption of the outer shell or wall of the deer truffle. Elephomyces which along with magnifying radiocesium also magnifies or concentrates natural soil concentrations of arsenic. The Norwegian Agricultural Authority reported that in 2009 a total of 18,000 livestock in Norway required uncontaminated feed for a period before slaughter to ensure that their meat had an activity below the government-permitted value of cesium per kilogram deemed suitable for human consumption. This contamination was due to residual radioactivity from Chernobyl in the plants they graze on in the wild during the summer. 1,914 sheep required uncontaminated feed for a time before slaughter during 2012, and these sheep were located in just 18 of Norway's municipalities, a decrease of 17 from the 35 municipalities affected animals were located in during 2011, 117 municipalities were affected during 1986, the after-effects of Chernobyl were expected to be seen for a further 100 years, although the severity of the effects would decline over that period. Scientists report this is due to radioactive cesium-137 isotopes being taken up by fungi such as Cortinarius caparitus which is in turn eaten by sheep while grazing. The United Kingdom was forced to restrict the movement of sheep from upland areas when radioactive cesium-137 fell across parts of Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland and Northern England. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster in 1986, the movement of a total of 4,225,000 sheep was restricted across a total of 9,700 farms, to prevent contaminated meat entering the human food chain. The number of sheep and the number of farms affected has decreased since 1986. Northern Ireland was released from all restrictions in 2000 and by 2009, 369 farms containing around 190,000 sheep remained under the restrictions in Wales, Cumbria and Northern Scotland. The restrictions applying in Scotland were lifted in 2010, while those applying to Wales and Cumbria were lifted during 2012, meaning no farms in the UK remain restricted because of Chernobyl fallout. The legislation used to control sheep movement and compensate farmers farmers were latterly compensated per animal to cover additional costs in holding animals prior to radiation monitoring was revoked during October and November 2012 by the relevant authorities in the UK. Topic: Human impact. In the accident's aftermath, 237 people suffered from acute radiation sickness, of whom 31 died within the first 3 months. In 2005, the Chernobyl Forum, composed of the IAEA, other UN organizations and the governments of Belarus, Russia and Ukraine, published a report on the radiological environmental and health consequences of the Chernobyl accident. On the death toll, the report states that 28 emergency workers, liquidators, 
died from acute radiation syndrome, including beta burns, and 15 patients died from thyroid cancer in the following years, and it roughly estimated that cancer deaths caused by Chernobyl may reach a total of about 4,000 among the 5 million persons residing in the contaminated areas. The report projected cancer mortality increases of less than 1% approximately 0.3% on a time span of 80 years, cautioning that this estimate was speculative, since at this time only a few cancer deaths are linked to the Chernobyl disaster. The report says it is impossible to reliably predict the number of fatal cancers arising from the incident as small differences in assumptions can result in large differences in the estimated health costs. The report says it represents the consensus view of the eight UN organizations. Of all 66,000 Belarusian emergency workers, by the mid-1990s their government reported that only 150 roughly died. In contrast, 5,722 casualties were reported among Ukrainian cleanup workers up to the year 1995. By the National Committee for Radiation Protection of the Ukrainian Population, the four most harmful radionuclides spread from Chernobyl were iodine 131, cesium 134, cesium 137, and strontium 90, with half lives of 8.02 days, 2.07 years, 30.2 years and 28.8 years respectively. The iodine was initially viewed with less alarm than the other isotopes, because of its short half-life, but it is highly volatile, and now appears to have traveled furthest and caused the most severe health problems in the short term. Strontium, on the other hand, is the least volatile of the four, and of main concern in the areas near Chernobyl itself. Iodine tends to become concentrated in thyroid and milk glands, leading, among other things, to increased incidence of thyroid cancers. Cesium tends to accumulate in vital organs such as the heart, while strontium accumulates in bones, and may thus be a risk to bone marrow and lymphocytes. Radiation is most damaging to cells that are actively dividing. In adult mammals cell division is slow, except in hair follicles, skin, bone marrow and the gastrointestinal tract, which is why vomiting and hair loss are common symptoms of acute radiation sickness. Topic assessment difficulties By the year 2000, the number of Ukrainians claiming to be radiation sufferers paterpili, and receiving state benefits had jumped to 3.5 million, or 5% of the population. Many of these are populations resettled from contaminated zones, or former or current Chernobyl plant workers. According to IAEA-affiliated scientific bodies, these apparent increases of ill health result partly from economic strains on these countries and poor health care and nutrition. Also, they suggest that increased medical vigilance following the accident has meant that many cases that would previously have gone unnoticed, especially of cancer, are now being registered. The World Health Organization states, children conceived before or after their father's exposure showed no statistically significant differences in mutation frequencies. This statistically insignificant increase was also seen by independent researchers analyzing the children of the Chernobyl liquidators. On farms in Narodichi Rayon of Ukraine, it is claimed that in the first four years of the disaster, nearly 350 animals were born with gross deformities such as missing or extra limbs, missing eyes, heads or ribs, or deformed skulls. In comparison, only three abnormal births had been registered in the five years prior. 
The two primary individuals involved with the attempt to suggest that the mutation rate among animals was, and continues to be, higher in the Chernobyl zone, are the Anders Mahler and Timothy Musso group. Apart from continuing to publish experimentally unrepeatable and discredited papers, Musso routinely gives talks at the Helen Caldicott organized symposiums for Physicians for Social Responsibility, an anti-nuclear advocacy group, devoted to bring about a nuclear-free planet. Moreover, in years past Mahler was previously caught and reprimanded for publishing papers that crossed the scientific misconduct, fraud, line. The duo have more recently attempted to publish meta-analyses in which the primary references they weigh up, analyze and draw their conclusions from as their own prior papers along with the discredited book Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. In 1996, geneticist colleagues Ronald Chesser and Robert Baker published a paper on the thriving vole population within the exclusion zone, in which the central conclusion of their work was essentially that the mutation rate in these animals is hundreds and probably thousands of times greater than normal. This claim occurred after they had done a comparison of the mitochondrial DNA of the Chernobyl voles with that of a control group of voles from outside the region. These alarming conclusions led the paper to appear on the front cover of the prestigious journal Nature. However, not long after publication, Chesser and Baker discovered a fundamental error in their research in which they had incorrectly classified the species of vole, and therefore were comparing the genetics of two entirely different vole species to start with. Topic. Abortions Following the accident, journalists mistrusted many medical professionals such as the spokesman from the UK National Radiological Protection Board, and in turn encouraged the public to mistrust them. Throughout the European continent, due to this media-driven framing of the slight contamination and in nations where abortion is legal, many requests for induced abortions, of otherwise normal pregnancies, were obtained out of fears of radiation from Chernobyl, including an excess number of abortions in Denmark in the months following the accident. In Greece, following the accident many obstetricians were unable to resist requests from worried pregnant mothers over fears of radiation. Although it was determined that the effective dose to Greeks would not exceed 1 mSv, mm, a dose much lower than that which could induce embryonic abnormalities or other non-stochastic effects, there was an observed 2,500 excess of otherwise wanted pregnancies being terminated, probably out of fear in the mother of radiation risk. A slightly above the expected number of requested induced abortions occurred in Italy, worldwide, an estimated excess of about 150,000 elective abortions may have been performed on otherwise healthy pregnancies out of unfounded fears of radiation from Chernobyl, according to Robert Baker and ultimately a 1987 article published by Linda E. Ketchum in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine which mentions but does not reference an IAEA source on the matter. The available statistical data excludes the Soviet Ukraine Belarus abortion rates, as they are presently unavailable. From the available data, an increase in the number of abortions in what were healthy developing human offspring in Denmark occurred in the months following the accident, at a rate of about 400 cases. In Greece, there was an observed 2,500 excess of otherwise wanted pregnancies being terminated. In Italy, a slightly above the expected number of induced abortions occurred, approximately 100. As the increase in radiation in Denmark was so low, 
the public debate and anxiety among the pregnant women and their husbands caused more fetal deaths in Denmark than the accident. This underlines the importance of public debate, the role of the mass media and of the way in which national health authorities participate in this debate. No evidence of changes in the prevalence of human deformities, birth congenital anomalies which might be associated with the accident, are apparent in Belarus or the Ukraine, the two republics which had the highest exposure to fallout. In Sweden, and Finland where no increase in abortion rates occurred, it was likewise determined that no association between the temporal and spatial variations in radioactivity and variable incidence of congenital malformations was found. A similar null increase in the abortion rate and a healthy baseline situation of no increase in birth defects was determined by assessing the Hungarian Congenital Abnormality Registry, findings also mirrored in Austria. Larger, mainly Western European, data sets approaching a million births in the EUROCAT database, divided into exposed and control groups were assessed in 1999. As no Chernobyl impacts were detected, the researchers conclude. In retrospect the widespread fear in the population about the possible effects of exposure on the unborn fetus was not justified. Despite studies from Germany and Turkey, the only robust evidence of negative pregnancy outcomes that transpired after the accident were these elective abortion indirect effects, in Greece, Denmark, Italy etc., due to the anxieties created. In very high doses, it was known at the time that radiation can cause a physiological increase in the rate of pregnancy anomalies, but unlike the dominant linear no-threshold model of radiation and cancer rate increases, it was known, by researchers familiar with both the prior human exposure data and animal testing, that the Malformation of organs appears to be a deterministic effect with a threshold dose, below which, no rate increase is observed. This teratology birth defects issue was discussed by Frank Castronovo of the Harvard Medical School in 1999, publishing a detailed review of dose reconstructions and the available pregnancy data following the Chernobyl accident, inclusive of data from Kiev's two largest obstetrics hospitals. Castronovo concludes that the lay press with newspaper reporters playing up anecdotal stories of children with birth defects is, together with dubious studies that show selection bias, the two primary factors causing the persistent belief that Chernobyl increased the background rate of birth defects. When the vast amount of pregnancy data does not support this perception as no women took part in the most radioactive liquidator operations, no in utero individuals would have been expected to have received a threshold dose. In one small behavioral study in 1998, with low statistical power and limited multivariate analysis which akin to the widely published Hiroshima and Nagasaki studies, investigated and selected the children, who were in utero during the rapidly dividing and therefore radiosensitive phase of neurogenesis 8 to 16 weeks of gestation, and whose mothers were evacuated from some of the more energetic hot spot parts of the Chernobyl exclusion zone following the accident. From a random selection of 50 individuals in late childhood in 1998, a low-quality statistically significant increase in the rate of severe IQ reduction was found, with a threshold of a suggested approximately 0.30 sieverts 300 millisieverts as a thyroid dose to the developing human head. For the beginning emergence of cerebral disorder, 
the Chernobyl liquidators, essentially an all-male civil defense emergency workforce, would go on to father normal children, without an increase in developmental anomalies or a statistically significant increase in the frequencies of germline mutations in their progeny. This normality is similarly seen in the children of the survivors of the Guyana accident. Topic. S answer assessments A report by the International Atomic Energy Agency examines the environmental consequences of the accident. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation has estimated a global collective dose of radiation exposure from the accident equivalent on average to 21 additional days of world exposure to natural background radiation." Individual doses were far higher than the global mean among those most exposed, including 530,000 primarily male recovery workers the Chernobyl liquidators, who averaged an effective dose equivalent to an extra 50 years of typical natural background radiation exposure each. Estimates of the number of deaths that will eventually result from the accident vary enormously. Disparities reflect both the lack of solid scientific data and the different methodologies used to quantify mortality. Whether the discussion is confined to specific geographical areas or extends worldwide, and whether the deaths are immediate, short-term, or long-term. In 1994, 31 deaths were directly attributed to the accident, all among the reactor staff and emergency workers. As of the 2008 report by the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, and the total number of confirmed deaths from radiation was 64 and was expected to continue to rise. The Chernobyl Forum predicts that the eventual death toll could reach 4,000 among those exposed to the highest levels of radiation, 200,000 emergency workers, 116,000 evacuees and 270,000 residents of the most contaminated areas. This figure is a total causal death toll prediction, combining the deaths of approximately 50 emergency workers who died soon after the accident accident from acute radiation syndrome, 15 children who have died of thyroid cancer and a future predicted total of 3,935 deaths from radiation-induced cancer and leukemia. In a peer-reviewed paper in the International Journal of Cancer in 2006, the authors expanded the discussion on those exposed to all of Europe, but following a different conclusion methodology to the Chernobyl Forum study, which arrived at the total predicted death toll of 4,000 after cancer survival rates were factored in, they stated, without entering into a discussion on deaths, that in terms of total excess cancers attributed to the accident, the risk projections suggest that by now 2006, Chernobyl may have caused about 1,000 cases of thyroid cancer and 4,000 cases of other cancers in Europe, representing about 0.01% of all incident cancers since the accident. Models predict that by 2065 about 16,000 cases of thyroid cancer and 25,000 cases of other cancers may be expected due to radiation from the accident, whereas several hundred million cancer cases are expected from other causes. Two anti-nuclear advocacy groups have publicized non-peer-reviewed estimates that include mortality estimates for those who were exposed to even smaller amounts of radiation. The Union of Concerned Scientists UCS, calculated that, among the hundreds of millions of people exposed worldwide, there will be an eventual 50,000 excess cancer cases, resulting in 25,000 excess cancer deaths, excluding thyroid cancer. 
However, these calculations are based on a simple linear no-threshold model multiplication and the misapplication of the collective dose, which the International Commission on Radiological Protection ICRP states, should not be done, as using the collective dose is inappropriate to use in risk projections. Along similar lines to the UCS approach, the 2006 Torch Report, commissioned by the European Greens political party, likewise simplistically calculates an eventual 30,000 to 60,000 excess cancer deaths in total, around the globe. In 2004, the UN Collaborative, Chernobyl Forum, revealed thyroid cancer among children to be one of the main health impacts from the Chernobyl accident. This is due to the ingestion of contaminated dairy products, along with the inhalation of the short-lived, highly radioactive isotope, iodine-131. In that publication, more than 4,000 cases of childhood thyroid cancer were reported. It is important to note that there was no evidence of an increase in solid cancers or leukemia. It said that there was an increase in psychological problems among the affected population. The WHO's radiation program reported that the 4,000 cases of thyroid cancer resulted in nine deaths, according to the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. Up to the year 2005, an excess of over 6,000 cases of thyroid cancer had been reported. That is, over the estimated pre-accident baseline thyroid cancer rate, more than 6,000 casual cases of thyroid cancer have been reported in children and adolescents exposed at the time of the accident, a number that is expected to increase. They concluded that there is no other evidence of major health impacts from the radiation exposure. Well differentiated thyroid cancers are generally treatable, and when treated, the five year survival rate of thyroid cancer is 96%, and 92% after 30 years. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation had reported 15 deaths from thyroid cancer in 2011. The International Atomic Energy Agency IAEA, also states that there has been no increase in the rate of birth defects or abnormalities, or solid cancers, such as lung cancer corroborating the assessments by the UN committee. UNSCEAR raised the possibility of long-term genetic defects, pointing to a doubling of radiation-induced mini-satellite mutations among children born in 1994. However, the risk of thyroid cancer associated with the Chernobyl accident is still high according to published studies. The German affiliate of the Ultra Anti Nuclear Energy Organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, suggest that 10,000 people are affected by thyroid cancer as of 2006 and that 50,000 cases are expected in the future. Topic. Other health disorders Fred Mettler, a radiation expert at the University of New Mexico, puts the number of worldwide cancer deaths outside the highly contaminated zone at perhaps 5,000, for a total of 9,000 Chernobyl-associated fatal cancers, saying, the number is small, representing a few percent, relative to the normal spontaneous risk of cancer, but the numbers are large in absolute terms. The same report outlined studies based on data found in the Russian registry from 1991 to 1998 that suggested that 
Of 61,000 Russian workers exposed to an average dose of 107 mSv about 5% of all fatalities that occurred may have been due to radiation exposure. The report went into depth about the risks to mental health of exaggerated fears about the effects of radiation. According to the IAEA the designation of the affected population as victims rather than survivors has led them to perceive themselves as helpless weak and lacking control over their future the IAEA says that this may have led to behavior that has caused further health effects fred mettler commented that 20 years later the population remains largely unsure of what the effects of radiation actually are and retain a sense of foreboding. A number of adolescents and young adults who have been exposed to modest or small amounts of radiation feel that they are somehow fatally flawed and there is no downside to using illicit drugs or having unprotected sex. To reverse such attitudes and behaviors will likely take years, although some youth groups have begun programs that have promise. In addition, disadvantaged children around Chernobyl suffer from health problems that are attributable not only to the Chernobyl accident, but also to the poor state of post Soviet health systems. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, UNSCEAR, part of the Chernobyl Forum, have produced their own assessments of the radiation effects. UNSCEAR was set up as a collaboration between various United Nation bodies, including the World Health Organization, after the atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to assess the long-term effects of radiation on human health. Topic: <laughs> Radiation exposure deaths. The number of potential deaths arising from the Chernobyl disaster is heavily debated. The WHO's prediction of 4,000 future cancer deaths in surrounding countries is based on the linear no-threshold model LNT, which assumes that the damage inflicted by radiation at low doses is directly proportional to the dose. Radiation epidemiologist Roy Shore contends that estimating health effects in a population from the LNT model is not wise because of the uncertainties. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists the number of excess cancer deaths worldwide, including all contaminated areas, is approximately 27,000 based on the same LNT. Another study critical of the Chernobyl Forum report was commissioned by Greenpeace, which asserted that the most recently published figures indicate that in Belarus, Russia and Ukraine the accident could have resulted in 10,000 to 2,000. 200,000 additional deaths in the period between 1990 and 2004. The scientific secretary of the Chernobyl Forum criticized the report's reliance on non-peer-reviewed locally produced studies. Although most of the study's sources were from peer-reviewed journals, including many Western medical journals, the higher mortality estimates were from non-peer-reviewed sources, while Gregory Hartle spokesman for the WHO suggested that the conclusions were motivated by ideology. Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment is a 2007 Russian publication that concludes that there were 985,000 premature deaths as a consequence of the radioactivity released. The results were criticized by M. I. Balanov from the Institute of Radiation Hygiene in St. Petersburg, who described them as biased, drawing from sources which were difficult to independently verify and lacking a proper scientific base. Balanov expressed his opinion that 
The authors unfortunately did not appropriately analyze the content of the Russian language publications, for example, to separate them into those that contain scientific evidence and those based on hasty impressions and ignorant conclusions. According to U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission member and professor of health physics Kenneth Mossman, the LNT philosophy is overly conservative, and low-level radiation may be less dangerous than commonly believed. Yoshihisa Matsumoto, a radiation biologist at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, cites laboratory experiments on animals to suggest there must be a threshold dose below which DNA repair mechanisms can completely repair any radiation damage. Mossman suggests that the proponents of the current model believe that being conservative is justified due to the uncertainties surrounding low-level doses and it is better to have a prudent public health policy. Another significant issue is establishing consistent data on which to base the analysis of the impact of the Chernobyl accident. Since 1991 large social and political changes have occurred within the affected regions and these changes have had significant impact on the administration of health care, on socio-economic stability, and the manner in which statistical data is collected. Ronald Chesser, a radiation biologist at Texas Tech University, says that the subsequent Soviet collapse, scarce funding, imprecise dosimetry, and difficulties tracking people over the years have limited the number of studies and their reliability. Topic: <laughs> Social economic effect. It is difficult to establish the total economic cost of the disaster. According to Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet Union spent 18 billion rubles, the equivalent of 18 billion United States dollars at that time, or 35.7 billion dollars in today's dollars, on containment and decontamination, virtually bankrupting itself. In 2005, the total cost over 30 years for Belarus alone was estimated at US$235 billion, about US$297 billion in today's dollars given inflation rates. Ongoing costs are well known. In their 2003 to 2005 report, the Chernobyl Forum stated that between 5% and 7% of government spending in Ukraine is still related to Chernobyl, while in Belarus over $13 billion is thought to have been spent between 1991 and 2003, with 22% of national budget having been Chernobyl-related in 1991, falling to 6% by 2002. In 2018, Ukraine spent 5 to 7% of its national budget on recovery activities related to the Chernobyl disaster. Overall economic loss is estimated at 235 billion dollars in Belarus. Much of the current cost relates to the payment of Chernobyl-related social benefits to some 7 million people across the three countries. A significant economic impact at the time was the removal of 784,320 hectares, 1,938,100 acres of agricultural land and 694,200 hectares, 1,750,000 15,000 acres of forest from production. While much of this has been returned to use, agricultural production costs have risen due to the need for special cultivation techniques, fertilizers and additives. Politically, the accident gave great significance to the new Soviet policy of Glasnost, and helped forge closer Soviet-U.S. relations at the end of the Cold War, through bioscientific cooperation. 
The disaster also became a key factor in the Union's eventual 1991 dissolution, and a major influence in shaping the new Eastern Europe, both Ukraine and Belarus. In their first months of independence, lowered legal radiation thresholds from the Soviet Union's previous, elevated thresholds from 35 rems per lifetime under the USSR to 7 rems per lifetime in Ukraine and 0.1 rems per year in Belarus. Topic. Aftermath Following the accident, questions arose about the future of the plant and its eventual fate. All work on the unfinished reactors 5 and 6 was halted three years later. However, the trouble at the Chernobyl plant did not end with the disaster in Reactor 4. The damaged reactor was sealed off and 200 cubic meters 260 cu -yd of concrete was placed between the disaster site and the operational buildings. The work was managed by Grigory Mihailovich Naginsky, the deputy chief engineer of installation and construction directorate 90. The Ukrainian government continued to let the three remaining reactors operate because of an energy shortage in the country. Topic: Decommissioning. In October 1991, a fire broke out in the turbine building of Reactor 2. The authorities subsequently declared the reactor damaged beyond repair, and it was taken offline. Reactor 1 was decommissioned in November 1996 as part of a deal between the Ukrainian government and international organizations such as the IAEA to end operations at the plant. On 15 December 2000, then-President Leonid Kuchma personally turned off Reactor 3 in an official ceremony, shutting down the entire site. Topic. Confinement Soon after the accident, the reactor building was quickly encased by a mammoth concrete sarcophagus in a notable feat of construction under severe conditions. Crane operators worked blindly from inside lead-lined cabins taking instructions from distant radio observers, while gargantuan-sized pieces of concrete were moved to the site on custom-made vehicles. The purpose of the sarcophagus was to stop any further release of radioactive particles into the atmosphere, mitigate damage should the core go critical and explode, and provide safety for the continued operations of adjacent reactors 1, 2 and 3. The concrete sarcophagus was never intended to last very long, with a lifespan of only 30 years. On 12 February 2013, a 600 square meters 6, square feet section of the roof of the turbine building collapsed, adjacent to the sarcophagus, causing a new release of radioactivity and temporary evacuation of the area. At first it was assumed that the roof collapsed because of the weight of snow, however the amount of snow was not exceptional, and the report of a Ukrainian fact-finding panel concluded that the collapse was the result of sloppy repair work and aging of the structure. Experts warned the sarcophagus itself was on the verge of collapse. In 1997, the International Chernobyl Shelter Fund was founded to design and build a more permanent cover for the unstable and short lived sarcophagus. It received over €810 million Euros and was managed by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. EBRD. The new shelter was named the New Safe Confinement and construction began in 2010. 
It is a metal arch 105 meters, 344 feet high and spanning 257 meters, 843 feet, built on rails adjacent to the reactor 4 building so that it could be slid over top the existing sarcophagus. The new safe confinement was completed in 2016 and slid into place over top the sarcophagus on November 29. The huge steel arch was moved into place over several weeks. Unlike the original sarcophagus, the new safe confinement is designed to allow the reactor to be safely dismantled using remotely operated equipment. Topic. Waste management As of 2006, some fuel remained in the reactors at Units 1 through 3, most of it in each unit's spent fuel pool, as well as some material in a small spent fuel interim storage facility pond ISF1. In 1999 a contract was signed for construction of a radioactive waste management facility to store 25,000 used fuel assemblies from Units 1 to 3 and other operational wastes, as well as material from decommissioning Units 1 to 3 which will be the first RBMK units decommissioned anywhere. The contract included a processing facility able to cut the RBMK fuel assemblies and to put the material in canisters, which were to be filled with inert gas and welded shut. The canisters were to be transported to dry storage vaults, where the fuel containers would be enclosed for up to 100 years. This facility, treating 2,500 fuel assemblies per year, would be the first of its kind for RBMK fuel. However, after a significant part of the storage structures had been built, technical deficiencies in the concept emerged, and the contract was terminated in 2007. The Interim Spent Fuel Storage Facility ISF2 will now be completed by others by mid-2013. Another contract has been let for a liquid radioactive waste treatment plant, to handle some 35,000 cubic meters 1,200,000 cubic feet of low and intermediate level liquid wastes at the site. This will need to be solidified and eventually buried along with solid wastes on site. In January 2008, the Ukrainian government announced a four-stage decommissioning plan that incorporates the above waste activities and progresses towards a cleared site. Topic: <laughs> Fuel containing materials. According to official estimates, about 95% of the fuel in Reactor 4 at the time of the accident about 180 metric tons 180 long tons, 200 short tons remains inside the shelter, with a total radioactivity of nearly 18 million curies 670 pbq. The radioactive material consists of core fragments, dust, and lava-like fuel-containing materials, FCM, also called corium, that flowed through the wrecked reactor building before hardening into a ceramic form. Three different lavas are present in the basement of the reactor building, black, brown, and a porous ceramic. The lava materials are silicate glasses with inclusions of other materials within them. The porous lava is brown lava that dropped into water and thus cooled rapidly. It is unclear how long the ceramic form will retard the release of radioactivity. 
From 1997 to 2002 a series of published papers suggested that the self-irradiation of the lava would convert all 1,200 metric tons 1,200 long tons, 1,300 short tons into a submicrometer and mobile powder within a few weeks. It has been reported that the degradation of the lava is likely to be a slow and gradual process rather than sudden and rapid. The same paper states that the loss of uranium from the wrecked reactor is only 10 kg per year. This low rate of uranium leaching suggests that the lava is resisting its environment. The paper also states that when the shelter is improved, the leaching rate of the lava will decrease. Topic. Exclusion zone An area originally extending 30 kilometers 19 miles in all directions from the plant is officially called the zone of alienation. It is largely uninhabited, except for about 300 residents who have refused to leave. The area has largely reverted to forest, and has been overrun by wildlife because of a lack of competition with humans for space and resources. Even today, radiation levels are so high that the workers responsible for rebuilding the sarcophagus are only allowed to work five hours a day for one month before taking 15 days of rest. As of 2016, 187 locals had returned and were living permanently in the zone. In 2011, Ukraine opened up the sealed zone around the Chernobyl reactor to tourists who wish to learn more about the tragedy that occurred in 1986. Serhi Mirny, a radiation reconnaissance officer at the time of the accident, and now an academic at National University of Kiev Mohyla Academy in Kiev, Ukraine, has written about the psychological and physical effects on survivors and visitors, and worked as an advisor to Chernobyl tourism groups. Topic. Forest fire concerns During the dry seasons, a perennial concern is forests that have been contaminated by radioactive material catching on fire. The dry conditions and buildup of debris make the forests a ripe breeding ground for wildfires. Depending on the prevailing atmospheric conditions, the fires could potentially spread the radioactive material further outwards from the exclusion zone in the smoke. In Belarus, the Belzrad organization is tasked with overseeing the food cultivation and forestry management in the area. Topic. Recovery projects The Chernobyl Trust Fund was created in 1991 by the United Nations to help victims of the Chernobyl accident. It is administered by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which also manages strategy formulation, resources mobilization, and advocacy efforts. Beginning 2002, under the United Nations Development Program, the fund shifted its focus from emergency assistance to long term development. The Chernobyl Shelter Fund was established in 1997 at the Denver 23rd G8 Summit to finance the Shelter Implementation Plan. SIP. The plan calls for transforming the site into an ecologically safe condition by means of stabilization of the sarcophagus followed by construction of a new safe confinement NSC. While the original cost estimate for the SIP was US 768 million United States dollars, the 2006 estimate was US 1.2 billion dollars. 
The SIP is being managed by a consortium of Bechtel, Battelle, and Electricité de France, and conceptual design for the NSC consists of a movable arch, constructed away from the shelter to avoid high radiation, to be slid over the sarcophagus. The NSC was moved into position in November 2016 and is expected to be completed in late 2017. In 2003, the United Nations Development Program launched the Chernobyl Recovery and Development Program (CRDP) for the recovery of the affected areas. The program was initiated in February 2002 based on the recommendations in the Report on Human Consequences of the Chernobyl Nuclear Accident. The main goal of the CRDP's activities is supporting the government of Ukraine in mitigating long-term social, economic, and ecological consequences of the Chernobyl catastrophe. CRDP works in the four most Chernobyl affected areas in Ukraine Kievska, Jytomirska, Chernihivska, and Rivninska. The International Project on the Health Effects of the Chernobyl Accident was created and received US$20 million, mainly from Japan, in hopes of discovering the main cause of health problems due to 131I radiation. These funds were divided among Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, the three main affected countries, for further investigation of health effects. As there was significant corruption in former Soviet countries, most of the foreign aid was given to Russia, and no positive outcome from this money has been demonstrated. Chernobyl Children International (CCI) is a UN-accredited non-profit international development, medical, and humanitarian organization that works with children, families, and communities that continue to be affected by the economic outcome of the Chernobyl accident. The organization's founder and chief executive is Adi Roche. The CCI was founded in 1991 in response to an appeal from Ukrainian and Belarusian doctors for aid. Roche then began organizing rest and recuperation holidays for a few Chernobyl children. It works closely with the Belarusian government, the United Nations, and many thousands of volunteers worldwide to deliver a broad range of economic supports to the children and the wider community. It also acts as an advocate for the rights of those affected by the Chernobyl explosion, and engages in research and outreach activities to encourage the rest of the world to remember the victims and understand the long-term impact on their lives. More than 18,000 Ukrainian children affected by the disaster have been treated at Cuba's Tarara resort town since 1990. Topic. Commemoration The Front Veranda 1986, a lithograph by Susan Dorothea White in the National Gallery of Australia, exemplifies worldwide awareness of the event. Heavy Water, a film for Chernobyl was released by Seventh Art in 2006 to commemorate the disaster through poetry and first-hand accounts. The film secured the Best Short Documentary at Cinequest Film Festival as well as the Rhode Island Best Score Award along with a screening at Tate Modern. Chernobyl Way is an annual rally run on 26 April by the opposition in Belarus as a remembrance of the Chernobyl disaster. Topic. Nuclear debate The Chernobyl accident attracted a great deal of interest. Because of the distrust that many people had in the Soviet authorities, a great deal of debate about the situation at the site occurred in the First World during the early days of the event. 
Because of defective intelligence based on satellite imagery, it was thought that Unit No. 3 had also suffered a dire accident. Journalists mistrusted many professionals, and they in turn encouraged the public to mistrust them. In Italy, the Chernobyl accident was reflected in the outcome of the 1987 referendum. As a result of that referendum, Italy began phasing out its nuclear power plants in 1988, a decision that was effectively reversed in 2008. A 2011 referendum reiterated Italians' strong objections to nuclear power, thus abrogating the government's decision of 2008. In Germany, the Chernobyl accident led to the creation of a federal environment ministry, after several states had already created such a post. The minister was given the authority over reactor safety as well, which the current minister still holds as of 2015. The events are also credited with strengthening the anti-nuclear movement in Germany, which culminated in the decision to end the use of nuclear power that was made by the 1998 to 2005 Schroeder government in direct response to the Chernobyl disaster. A conference to create a convention on early notification of a nuclear accident was called in 1986 by the International Atomic Energy Agency. The resulting treaty has bound signatory member states to provide notification of any nuclear and radiation accidents that occur within its jurisdiction that could affect other states, along with the Convention on Assistance in the Case of a Nuclear Accident or Radiological Emergency. In the United States people became motivated by the Chernobyl disaster to investigate and draw parallels to their own government's nuclear problems. The Hanford site has become known as America's Chernobyl, and many parallels have been drawn between the causes of the Chernobyl accident and the causes of the catastrophic and ongoing situation at Hanford. Additionally, Chernobyl, along with the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, the Three Mile Island accident, and the Bhopal disaster have been used together as case studies, both by the U.S. government and by third parties, in research concerning the root causes of such disasters, such as sleep deprivation and mismanagement. Topic. See also List of Chernobyl-related articles List of industrial disasters Lists of nuclear disasters and radioactive incidents Nuclear and radiation accidents and incidents